Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless the antichrist will control a one world religion as we read in revelation 17 1 through 5 and verse 15 then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying to me come i will show you the judgment of the great harlot which is the one world false religion who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, which is the one world false religion and of the abominations of the earth. Verse 15, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw, where the harlot sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, which is the world. There are convincing arguments for the one world religion being Catholicism, Islam, and all other religions combining, proclaiming we all worship the same God. Are we seeing any signs of a one world religion forming today? One of the things that struck me about all of you here is your ability to engage in interreligious dialogue. Dove ci porta questo? Because if we start to fight amongst ourselves and saying, my religion is more important than yours, my religion is true, yours is not, where will that lead us? Dove? Where will it lead us? Because every religion is a way to arrive at God. Ma Dio è Dio per tutti. But God is, is God for all. Figli di Dio. And if God is God for all, then we're all sons and daughters of God. Many people wrongly believe that everyone is a child of God. The Bible teaches us this is not true. We can only become his children when we believe in the name of Jesus Christ, as we read in John 1.12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. But my God is more important than your God. Is that true? Sheikh, Muslim, Hindu, Christian. There, there are different paths. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This last day's one world religion the great harlot of Babylon will have great worldwide influence over peoples and nations. Eventually, the harlot, the one world false religion, will lose favor with the Antichrist, who will want to receive the world's worship for himself, as we read in Revelation 17, verses 16 and 17. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, the one world false religion, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire, for God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast, until the words of God are fulfilled. The Antichrist will not share the adoration of the world with the prophets and priests of the false religion, no matter how obsequious or fawning they may be. Once the Antichrist gains the world's amazed attention by his miraculous return from the dead, he will turn on the false religious system and destroy it, establishing himself as God, as we read in Revelation 13, 11 and 12. Then I saw another beast, who is the false prophet, coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he, the false prophet, exercises all the authority of the first beast, who is the Antichrist, in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, who is the Antichrist, whose deadly wound was healed. Pope Francis landing back in Rome after the longest trip of his papacy, the 87-year-old pontiff visiting four countries spanning two different continents. And our Inez de la Quatera is in Singapore on that history-making 12-day journey as the Pope shared his message of religious harmony. 
Pope Francis kicking off the most ambitious trip of his pontificate with Indonesia, the world's most populous Muslim-majority country, where his message centered on how different religions can coexist. The Pope stopping by the largest mosque in Southeast Asia, visiting the Tunnel of Friendship, linking it to a nearby cathedral, and sharing this sweet moment with the country's grand imam, the two leaders practicing what they preach as they called for greater interfaith dialogue. In various regions, we see the emergence of violent conflicts, he said, which are often the result of a lack of mutual respect. Then the Pope was off to Papua New Guinea, where he was greeted with an array of dazzling dances. Pope Francis here in Papua New Guinea receiving a very warm welcome. You can see all the singing and dancing, all of these people wearing their traditional clothing. In Port Moresby, one of the world's most dangerous cities and the furthest he'd ever been from Rome, Francis reaching out to what he likes to call the peripheries of the Catholic Church. The Pope even boarding an Australian Royal Air Force C-130 to visit the remote settlement of Vanimo, where some of those waiting for him had walked for days through jungles and over mountains. He was gifted a traditional feathered headdress while he brought with him nearly a ton of humanitarian aid and a message of peace. He made his third stop in Timor-Leste, Asia's new newest nation and the second most Catholic country in the world, just behind the Vatican, with over 97 percent of people identifying as Catholics. The Pope there greeted like a rock star, with roughly half of the country's entire population coming out for an open-air history-making mass. We want to peace for the world, especially for the poor. Last stop, Singapore, where Catholics are in the minority. The Pope circling back to that message of religious harmony, saying Singapore sets an example for the rest of the world. Everyone has the right to practice their religion. Everyone lives harmoniously here. A 12-day, four-country, two-continent journey. Ecumenical means worldwide, universal, unity of religions. The ultimate goal of the ecumenical movement is to bring all religious groups together into one worldwide group. In their words, we may not all be Catholics or Methodists, Muslim or Lutherans, etc., but we all still worship the same God. The goal of the ecumenical movement is to destroy the belief in absolute authority coming from God and putting in its place the relative authority of man, composed of the preferences and opinions of men who consider themselves fully equipped to be your guide instead of the Holy Bible itself. Hebrews 4, 12, and 13 for the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. John 17.21 That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. John 17.21 is often used by ecumenists as a proof text for their objectives, but they fail to point out that Jesus was not instructing Christians to create some sort of ecumenical unity. He was praying for God the Father to create a spiritual unity. The unity Christ prayed for is one based on truth and the Word of God, as we read in 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. The ecumenical movement downplays the importance of truth and doctrine. The ecumenical movement downplays doctrinal purity and refuses to practice biblical separation. The Bible teaching of separation forbids God's people from fellowshipping with error, as we read in Romans 16, 17, and 18. Now I urge you, brethren, Note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. The Apostle Paul was very adamant on the importance of sound doctrine in his letters to Titus and Timothy. Titus 2.1 But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.12-13 and 13. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come. Give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.16 Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. 
persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. The final book of the Bible describes the worldwide religious harlot which will arise in these last days. God's command in regard to this apostasy is come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. The Pope tonight is weighing in on the upcoming election after he was asked by CBS News about what advice he would have for a Catholic voter on who to vote for. Pope Francis made it clear that he doesn't agree with Trump's tough immigration policy nor Harris's stance on abortion rights. They are both against life. The one who throws away the migrants, as well as the one who kills children, both are against life. Who is the lesser of two evils? That lady or that gentleman? I don't know. The Roman Catholic Church sees Peter as the first pope in Matthew 16:18, upon whom God had chosen to build his church, which is a false teaching. Matthew 16:18, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. In the Bible, Jesus is referred to as the cornerstone, which means he is the foundation, measuring guide, and standard for ordering and aligning lives in the building of God's kingdom, as we read in Matthew 21, 42. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus, in Matthew 21, 42, points to himself as the cornerstone, citing Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. The Apostle Paul identifies Jesus as the church's sole foundation, as we read in 1 Corinthians 3.11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Was Peter the first pope? The answer, according to scripture, is a clear and emphatic no. Peter nowhere claims supremacy over the other apostles. Nowhere in his writings did the apostle Peter claim any special role, authority, or power over the church. Nowhere in scripture does Peter or any other apostle state that their apostolic authority would be passed on to successors. Finally, Scripture clearly says Jesus is the spiritual rock from which Christ followers drink from as we read in 1 Corinthians 10.4. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. This raises the question, is Pope Francis the false prophet spoken of in the book of Revelation? The false prophet of the end times, together with the Antichrist and Satan, who empowers both of them, will complete the unholy trinity of the end times. The false prophet is depicted as having horns like a lamb while speaking like a dragon, meaning he sounds like Jesus, the lamb, but speaks like a dragon, Satan. The false prophet's mission on earth is to force humanity to worship the Antichrist. He has all the authority of the Antichrist because like him, the false prophet is empowered by Satan. Whoever the false prophet turns out to be, the final world deception and the final apostasy will be great, and the whole world will be caught up in it. The deceivers and false teachers we see today are the forerunners of the Antichrist and the false prophet, and we must not be deceived by them. These false teachers abound, and they are moving us toward a final satanic kingdom. We must faithfully proclaim the saving gospel of Jesus Christ and rescue the souls of men and women from the coming disaster. So there is a choice. And I can make an effective case, I believe, that the choice is between good and evil. Unfortunately, the Pope, Pope Francis, doesn't see it that way. He is um, hes quite the character, isn't he? I'm a Catholic, and there are, I guess, certain dogma in the church that say he's infallible when it comes to certain matters of Scripture. I do believe that's debatable, and I also know that he is way out of line when he says something like this, and he's wrong. In general, 
Generally, it is said that not voting is bad. It is not good. You must vote, and you must choose the lesser evil. Who is the lesser evil? That lady or that gentleman? I don't know. Everyone in conscience has to think about it and do this. That lady or that gentleman, the lesser of two evils? Sorry, but who the hell is he to say this? Pope Pius? Where does he come off? I'm serious. The Bible's teaching on good versus evil leads to a challenging conclusion that every person is obligated to make a fundamental choice between the two. Eternally, this means we either choose to accept God and His salvation or align ourselves against Him. While we may be imperfect and fallible, we cannot be neutral in our approach to good versus evil. We are either seeking the goodness of God or the selfishness of evil. The prophet Isaiah put it succinctly, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, this guy has sent so many confusing and conflicting signals to the faithful that, well, both in the formal edicts that come out from the Vatican and stuff like this. Why did he do this? What was this all about? Yeah, he hosted a great big transgender jamboree. That is the Pope. This isn't artificial intelligence. This isn't some fantasy from somebody who works at Bravo TV. This actually happened. How about the time he hit that lady? Anybody remember that? Pope's hand pulling him toward her. Francis slapped her hand away before turning from the crowd. He hit that lady. One more time. What's wrong? What? What? You smack. And, you know, it's not like you're some guy. You're the Pope. She thinks miracles could happen if she touches you. Now, I got to cut the Pope a little bit of slack. After all, Joe Biden invaded his space. <laughs> remember when that happened? Um, I do remember, though, when Donald Trump was criticized by the Pope as well. This is what, what I thought, well, how do you respond to the Pope, right? I mean, well, you just respond. You just let the Pope have it, especially when the Pope deserves it. The Pope was getting involved in the 2016 election and commenting about border policy. I'm sorry, Pope, but stay the hell out of it. And, <laughs> well, Donald Trump actually was busy changing the game of politics, and it looked a little bit like this. I didn't think it was a good thing for him to say, frankly, and he was talking about the border. And as you know, I'm very strong on border security, and we have to have a border in this country. He actually said that maybe I'm not a good Christian or something. It's unbelievable, which is really not a nice thing to say. Not a nice thing to say. It's the Pope does not know Donald Trump to make a statement like that. And did the Pope really say this to Joe Biden? Now, if he did, this tells you a lot. This tells you a lot about the Pope. If he's saying that about Donald Trump and saying, well, something else about this guy, it's Joe bragging. So it's probably a lie. But watch. Mr. President, did the issue of abortion come up at all? No, it didn't. It came up when this talked about the fact that he was happy that was a good Catholic and keep the truth. Did the Pope really put it to him like that? I'm happy you're a good Catholic and uh, you should still receive communion, even though you are violating one of the huge tenets of the Catholic Church, right? This abortion thing, abortion all the way up to the ninth month. Did he really? Maybe he did. I mean, this Pope is very, very different, isn't he? All right, the choice between Trump and Kamala. I actually do think it's a choice between good and evil. You got that, Pope Pius? Okay, I'm sorry, Pope uh, Francis. Good and evil. You want an example? Well, look at our culture right now. Look at what's happening. Depravity. Depravity. We are losing this country. Reminder to the Pope, <laughs> Donald Trump, and I know you have officially said you don't like Roe v. Wade. You know who made it go away? He did. If that isn't good enough for the Pope, well, you desperately need a new Pope. There are only two groups of people in this world, the saved and the unsaved. Here's a question everyone needs to answer. Whether you are a Democrat, Republican, or not affiliated with either party, do you love Jesus? Many professing Christians say they love Jesus, but in all actuality, they hate him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Many who profess to be Christ followers are pro-abortion, pro-homosexual, and pro-transgender. 
they are defiant to the laws of God. As we read in 1 John 3, 4, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. How then can these people claim they love Jesus when he said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus declares, They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. As we read in Matthew 15, 8 and 9, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For those who say Jesus never said anything about abortion, homosexuality, and transgenderism being a sin, the Bible tells us all scripture is inspired by God as we read in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture has plenty of negative things to say about killing the innocent and homosexuality. It's called lawlessness. Many professing Christians justify sin by using Christ's commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself means telling them the truth in love, not by condoning their sin. The good news is, God will forgive all sin, as we read in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised Him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.